Hey, you just tapped and dropped into one of the most amazing sermons on the net today. Welcome to CNBC. Get ready to have your spirit uplifted and prepare to dive into God's Word. Enjoy today's broadcast. I want you to turn if you have your Bibles. Of course, we'll hit up on the screen here in a minute to Psalms 127 and then also put a thumb in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay? 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, but the only one I had Greg print out was the one from Psalms this morning. So, talking about building a strong marriage. You know, this is May. There's a lot of folks that are planning weddings in June. June is the most active month in the year for weddings. Haven't figured out what the deal is. Maybe it's because it's after spring, getting into the summer. June is the most active month for weddings in the United States. The most active months for divorces are December, right after Christmas when the bills all come in. You know, I, I'm not sure, but the truth is that, that June is that, that month for marriage. So why is marriage important? It's important to the scripture as far as the Bible's concerned. It is the foundation for the family and the foundation for civilization. A lot of people don't realize how important a strong marriage, a good marriage is to the overall well-being of the community and of the world. If marriages were stronger today, we would have a whole lot less problems than what we're dealing with right now, I believe, in society. Because there would be a foundation, a solidness of the relationships that could be taught to our children that are not being taught to many children. The United States has a divorce rate of 53%. Now, we were married back when the dinosaur owned, as my kids think, that was probably 20 to 21% divorces at that time. We were married in 1966. And yes, I remember the date, August 6, 1966. Lyndon Bird Johnson's daughter was married on the same day. I don't know if they're still together or not, but that day in age, Changed the 50s and 60s, there was a rapid, what we call diametric change, a shift in society. And we begin to see an increase in divorces. Now, under something, I understand the Bible talks about divorce, and I understand that divorces were permitted by Moses. Jesus said that was permitted. He said, except for adultery. You know, it was a level in that sense except for unfaithfulness. Here's the thing. How do we make marriages strong where they're at? Whether you've gone through a divorce or whether this is your first marriage, how do we make marriages strong to start off with? That's the key. That's what the scripture needs to talk about and does talk about today. So if you look in Psalms 127, it says this, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to set up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. In our society, there has been a breakdown in marriage, in the American home. One person asked over an interview, in a television interview, does anyone stay together anymore? Yeah, there are folks that stay together. I remember when my mom and dad were uh, celebrating their 49th anniversary, that somebody asked, well, what made you all stay together? They said, we couldn't afford to go apart. It costs too much to live two separate lives and one person pay for it. They came from a generation that didn't throw uh, things away. They didn't throw away regular machinery. That was the day of bailing wire and duct tape. They didn't throw away articles at home. They fixed them. There used to be fix-it shops all across our little town that you could take stuff to. They repaired things. They didn't throw away their marriage. They worked things out. 
And that's really what we ought to be doing today. But we are living in a, what I call a trash society. If it doesn't work, throw it away. If the marriage doesn't work, throw it away. It has no part because it just doesn't work. Therefore, let's get rid of it. That's a problem. And that's why our society is in the condition that it's in. A few things that I found about marriage here just a little while ago. It says, according to the Genesis World Book of Records, the greatest number of marriages in a monogamous world was contracted by an American, Glenn D. Moss Wolf, who married 19 times since 1931. He keeps two wedding dresses in the closet for ready use. They are different sizes. He has, however, suffered 16 mother-in-laws. Married people do live longer. Okay, these are just some, some facts about marriage. According to insurance statistics, the death rate for married men aged 25 to 34 is 1.5 per thousand. For single men, it's twice as high, more than 3.5 per thousand. The difference is greater as married men get older. In the 35 to 44 group, the death rate for married men is 3.1 thousand. For unmarried, it's 8.3. Among all women, the mortality rate for single females is almost twice that of women who are, are or have been married, which could mean that the moral is this, better wed than dead. In San, Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, a man phoned New Mexico to ask that his engagement announcement be withdrawn. He was told that the item had already gone to press and remarked philosophically, oh, well, I guess I'll marry her then. In Coventry, England, I thought this one was really interesting, a man called at the Citizens Advice Bureau and asked to have his wife traced. It transpired that they had parted three days after their wedding nearly 25 years before and had not seen each other since. Asked whether he was thinking of a divorce, the man said, oh, no, I was just thinking it would be nice to get together to celebrate our silver wedding anniversary. How much did your wife cost, guys? In Tripoli, Libya, Libya's oil boom is pricing its women out of marriage to market. The usual stiff fee demanded by fathers of prospective bride, about 1,000 dinara, which is about 3,500 in cash with a camel, sheep, and some gold coins thrown in, has grown out of hand in the societies fueled by oil revenue. The groom's family in the low bracket transaction now gives the equivalent of 12,000 in cash, a new car, in addition to the customary camel and a sheep or two. The upper brackets gifts of 35,000 in cash are not unusual. Some men succumb to that amount to the ultimatum and pay the demand to some as readily as Libya's $5 billion a year oil income increases and allows that cash to be in their hands. However, there are those that are crossing frontiers in search of mates far less expensive. Officials lack figures, but sources report hundreds of Libyan males have gone west to Tunisia and east to Egypt, where the price of a wife is said to be around $200. How expensive is your wife? Well, marriage is important, even in other parts of the world. It can be costly. Some of the weddings that we have noted here recently of some of the celebrities have gone well over a million dollars. And I guess it's okay if you got the money, but folks, that's not what marriage is all about. It's not what the wedding is. It's what goes into the relationship before the wedding. That's the important thing. So when we look at this, how do we change what has been happening in our society? Well, number one, let's understand that a strong marriage is built upon the Lord. That's what verse one says there. It says, unless the Lord builds the house. Every time I've had a chance to do any wedding counseling, I try to, uh, that's the reason I don't do a lot of weddings because I demand six weeks of counseling before they, they wed. And not a lot of folks want to put that kind of time into that first step. But the reason that I do that is I want them to understand that what they're doing is making a commitment that's the same as a covenant with the Lord. And if Jesus is not as part of the center of the marriage, then there's going to be problems. Now, there's going to be problems in any marriage, but when Jesus is a part of the center of it, 
He is the guide and director that can help you overcome those. It's when you don't have that resource of Christ as your Savior in commonality. That's what the Bible means when it says, don't be unequally yoked. Now, I know a lot of young ladies that come to me and say, well, you know, he's a nice guy. And the first thing I ask him, I said, Do you, does he go to church? Is he a Christian? Well, no, he's a nice guy, though, and I think I can get him to change. Wrong. Who he is at that point in time is who he's going to be later on, unless it's a change that's made in his heart through Jesus Christ. You can't change someone. Jesus is the one who changes that individual. And as he does, they become more compatible. That's why the Bible says don't unequally yoke yourself because you're going to have some issues in that marriage from that point on. And yes, the Bible does say, if you're with a husband that is not saved, continue with them. Perhaps you might need to bring them to salvation. Yes, it does say that. But before you make that step, set some standards. Young ladies, set some standards for yourself. Young men, set some standards for yourself. What do you want in a mate that's going to last throughout the time that you're going to be together? It was never in my mind at all to ever divorce my wife. Kill her a couple of times, but not divorce. See, I get forgiven for murder. Now, the truth is, it's been a ride for the last 56 years, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Actually, we've known each other since we were five years old. And so that had been a relationship that has grown over the years. I'm the straight man in the family. Her and my daughter are the comedians. And they keep me going, believe me. So we built our relationship on Jesus. We started that way. Also, note that they are trying but are not sure to fail. Those that don't build on Jesus will try, but will fail. All their efforts will be to no avail if they don't have Jesus as a part of it. It reminds me of Paul's words about resurrection. He said, if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. Do you ever think about that? Paul giving an argument, a rabbinical argument there, is saying to those that are trying to say, well, you know, Jesus didn't really rise. He just ghosts come up. No, if he didn't rise, then our, va- our faith is in vain. But the Bible says he rose. He rose from the grave. And according to Paul, he said that if we believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Over there in Romans 10, 9. That's one of the first steps of salvation is to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Therefore, our faith is not in vain. And just like that, a marriage without Christ will fail. Building a marriage on the Lord gives a divine dimension to life. Our first day starts off this way. In in our family, we start off with the Bible reading and prayer. First thing in the morning, whether we want to or not, one of us will remember, oh yeah, get the Bible, got to do our devotion. Do we always feel like doing it? No. But we do it because after we've done it, we learn something about the Lord. And I inevitably something will happen in what we learned that day that will relate to what we had read. So I know that the Word of God is important and true. The first thing in that marriage is that we need to have the Word of God in our lives. We need to have a desire to serve the Lord from the start. I've had a lot of time in counseling young pastors and young men that have come to me and said, you know, I feel God is calling me. I said, how does your wife feel? I say, well, what does that matter if God's calling me? God's not going to call you and not call her. Listen to me. If there's a partnership in marriage and God is the center of it, he's not going to let one partner know and not the other one. He's not going to draw that other partner and draw, draw the other one. That relationship has to be there. I've seen too many young men go into ministry without their wives coming along and later see a divorce in that marriage and the ministry fail because they have not done what God wanted them to do. God will prepare both of you, and you've got to trust Him. And that's what we, we, we fail to do in marriage today. Things that are happening in our marriages are happening because we aren't listening to the Lord. Building a marriage on the Lord makes a difference when the storms come. 
Many marriages fall apart when trouble comes, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional. We've had an emotional ride this last couple of weeks. We uh, got to talking about it, wonder what else is the Lord's going to try to do to, to, to cause us all kinds of problems. First thing we had coming up was I had a bad test come back from my uh, uh, previous cancer that I had, and they had a, a rise in the PSA, and so we were scared to death about it coming back. Well, lo and behold, we just put it in the Lord's hand, went down for the test, went day before yesterday. The doctor says, the last one I took is coming down, so you don't have the cancer coming back, it's just something else. I thought, praise the Lord. Then they had the little heart stint situation that come along. I mean, these things came within two weeks of each other. Just boom, boom, boom. And it wasn't anything that I hadn't done. The stent just got plugged up. And I asked the doc about that. He says, yeah, they normally do sometimes. He said, you just have to be careful. He said, uh, I don't know, we'll change your medication up, see what else it does, and we'll go from there. He said, they unplugged it, put another stent in front of it, said, go on your merry way. Now, somebody asked you, well, do you have a heart I've not had one heart attack in the five stents that I've had. Praise God for that. I just know when things are not working right in my body and I can feel those things happening and God has given me that sense, the common sense to go get it checked out. And then this fall that we took, I thought, Lord, what else are we going to do? You know, because I was sitting there in my big chair and I mean, I had some pain right back in there. You know where that pain is right in there? You know? I had an ice pack on it, and then I was taking it to the hot, hot pa uh, pad, and then an ice pack and a hot pad, and a lidocaine patch on the back of it. And I thought, man, well, next day I got up, I'm just fine. And my shoulder quit hurting that I'd had therapy on the last week. God's great. He can get you through the storms. you got to trust him. She said, Mary asked me, she said, well, what are you going to do for this weekend? I'm going to go up and preach. What do you think I'm going to do? Do what God called me to do. Keep focused on what you're doing for the Lord. And the Lord will bring you through. Keep serving Him as a couple, and the Lord will bring you through. A strong marriage is built upon love. Not the Hollywood love. There's a difference. Over there in Corinthians 13, told you to put your thumb there. It said, love is long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's a passage that I use in many weddings as a part of wedding ceremony, because I want to remind the two that it's a covenant, and that trusting in the Lord as you are married, he gives you some words concerning love. Now, this is real love. This is not love that Hollywood is always displaying on the screen. This is not the sexual issues. This is not, you know, because let me tell you something, sexual issues are, are not the reason for marriage. However, it produces children which are the reason for marriage. Somebody said, well, why do you have a problem with homosexuality? I said, because it doesn't reproduce the human. The main reason for it to be a man and a woman is because there is a reproduction process there. And the reproduction process is what God blesses. If you go back over there when he married the first two, Adam and Eve, in the garden, you'll see that he blessed them to reproduce. Reproduction is the main reason for marriage that the society might grow in the sense of sexualness. And in, when man begins to pervert it, folks, we run into trouble. And that's what's happened in our society today. We have a perverted use or a view of sexuality. Its main purpose was to reproduce the population. Not that kind of love that Hollywood portrays. God gives us that definition of love there in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And here's the practical effects of that love. Love suffers long is patient, not exploding. Love suffers issues and situations. Now, you're not always going to agree with your mate. 
And if I'd ask you to raise your hand, how many of you all have lived together and never had an argument, most of you would lie. Truth is, we all have. We've all had our disagreements. But Mary and I live by this rule. She'll give her opinion, and she does. I have to make the final say, because she lives by this rule that I preached on. And that was what I preached several years ago, and I wish I could go back, take that off the recording that she's got of it, is that whatever happens in the house belongs to the man. And the man is the head of the house. God made it so. The wife is also a part of that household and can give her opinion. Whatever goes wrong in the house comes upon the final responsibility of the man. So she said, I can give my opinion, do anything I want, and he's in trouble. Thank goodness she doesn't. But the truth is, fellas, we are responsible for our household. We are to give the word of God in our household. It shouldn't be mama's uh, position to bring the Bible study, to bring the prayer. It's the man's responsibility. It's the man's responsibility to bring the word of God into the home. Now, the wife may share that responsibility and help him teach the children, but it's the man's responsibility to be the representative of God in that household. We are responsible. Therefore, we need to be long-suffering. Now, I know, guys, you wonder how much times you're going to have to be long-suffering. Just remember that the woman has an average of 25,000 words she has to say each day. The man only has 5,000. That's all he can interrupt. Truth is, our opinion counts. But we've got to do the final deciding. So we've got to be patient. Practical effects of love is long-suffering. Love is kind. Are you kind to one another? Are you kind in word? Are you kind in action? I want to give some of you young men advice right now. I was given a very short list for gifts, for birthdays, anniversaries, and Christmas. It's not a wash machine. It's not an iron. It's not a toaster. Three things. Flowers, candy, or sparklies. Short list. You can't go wrong. Okay? I'm going to keep you all out of trouble. Appliances are a part of their labor. We go out and buy a tool if we need it to do something, don't we? But we don't consider it a gift. Neither does she. I found that out one day when I bought her home a nail belt with a hammer because we were going to go on a mission trip up to Des Moines, Iowa and put a roof on a church up there. So I bought her this real neat S-wing roofing hammer and a nail belt and a couple other safety attractions. That's what she wore to bed that night. And there are certain things you don't get as gifts. You all need to remember that. You want to have a good marriage, folks. Think about what you're doing, guys. Bring home some flowers every once in a while. Bring home a box of candy. Bring home something that she has made mention of. And remember that what she's doing there to that house is supporting you. The average wife is worth, in today's world, $80,000 a year with the first stuff that she does at the home. If you want her to do that and pay her, that's what it would cost you. But she does that because of love. Long-suffering, kind. It vaults not itself. It's not puffed up. It's not for number one. It doesn't behave unseemly. It's not rude. It seeks not its own, her own. Not selfish. It's not easily provoked. Not irritable. Think of no evil. Hardly notices when done wrong and doesn't hold grudges. I guess in my marriage counseling that I've folks that come in that have gone through marriages, the biggest difficulties that there, there are is that we tend to sandbag on each other. And that's something we don't need to do. We don't settle argument. I, my mother was very right when she said, don't go to bed mad. Settle it before you go to bed. 
That way the issue doesn't allow you for anything to be brought back up. Once it's said and then forgotten and forgiven, let it go. But most of the issues that I have found in marriages have been where they have sandbagged issues from prior arguments and had not quite forgotten them, had not given them, and they're still festered. I had one couple come in that the woman was mad at her husband for 26 years because he did not get her to her, her mother's final words when her mother was dying. And for 26 years, she held that against him. And their marriage was pitiful. But she wouldn't admit that was the problem until the very last when I said, okay, what is the last issue? Because I had to write down a list of things, good and bad, pros and cons. And as we worked through that list, we came to that last one. I said, what is the last issue? And that was her biggest issue. It changed their marriage when it was forgiven. You cannot hold grudges if you want your marriage to last. You've got to admit them, confess them, forgive each other, and go on. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It doesn't like sin. A strong marriage is built upon loyalty. That's what 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says. For it believes all things, loyalty even when things are tough. It believeth all, or it beareth all things. It believes all things. Believing in your mate is trusting. You've got to trust that person. Hopes all things. Expects the best of the loved one. My wife, time, time and again, will tell me, she says, I'm very ambitious for you. Well, that's because she loves me. And she wants the best for me. Just as I want the best for her. That's why I've encouraged her in many different things that th she didn't think she could do. Even handed a computer. At the fun finally, at one time in one job, she was using two screens on a computer. Doesn't do it at home. She don't, don't like computers, but she did it at the work. She, so I encouraged her. For times she came home crying because of the job. But I encouraged her. You know, we got to encourage one another. We've got to be exhorters of one another if we want to see things happen in our marriages. Endures all things. That means you defend when others forsake. We defend each other. Somebody asked me, does that mean even against your mother and your father? And your, I said, yes. If you're married to that person, she's the first person in your life from that point on. The Bible says that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, no man stress it. Defend her, even if she's wrong. You say, what? Yeah, because you're no longer a couple. You're one. The Bible says that when a man and woman come together, they are one. If you don't defend her, you're not defending yourself. Endure all things together. Notice how all three of these things are true in the Lord's love. God loves us in this way. He should with us. He bears all things. He loves us to such a point that he is so patient with us that he hasn't killed us yet. And some of us deserve it. Truth is, all of us deserve death, but Jesus died on the cross for us, that we would not suffer eternity in hell. That's how many, much he left for us. He bared all things. He bore the punishment. He believes in us. He is our hope. He endures with us through all things. That's the kind of marriage you need. And that's the kind of marriage you can work for. Just remember those things. First of all, you build it on the Lord. Secondly, you build it upon love. Thirdly, you built it upon loyalty. You want to have a strong marriage, folks. God's got the ingredients right here. He's got the whole thing written down. Psychologists today are selling this in such a way that it's costing thousands and thousands of dollars. The Bible doesn't cost that much, and it's got all the answers. God's Word is there for you to strengthen you and your mate and your children and your family. You can have a strong marriage. It can be built on the Lord, on love, on loyalty. Where other houses may fail and fall, yours will not. 
if you put it on those three principles. Maybe you've come this morning seeking Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Maybe the Holy Spirit's been working on you. He wants that kind of love in your life. I tell young people today, and they get to thinking about, well, who's going to be my mate? I said, wait. God's got somebody for you. Be patient. Trust him. Don't trust what the world is saying about all of the sex and stuff that you need to have. Trust the Lord. He'll bring you the right person. Jesus is the right person for everyone. Jesus Christ can save you from sin, and he wants to do that. And he wants you to be a part of his family. You do know the church is re referred to as the bride of Christ. So it's interesting that marriage is that important to the Lord that he describes the church as his bride. If you need Jesus today, we want to invite you to come. Let me share with you who he is and how he can change your life. Maybe you just need to come to these altars and lay down some things and some burdens that you've had and just turn them over to him. Maybe you're looking for a church that you can serve with and grow with. You know, COVID's been kind of tough on churches. We're getting active and involved more again, as you can see with the activities going on. Somebody asked me, he says, well, what happens if another group comes in and we have a flu again? I'm not shutting the church down again. I don't care who's hearing me right now because we are broadcasting. Just the government needs to know we're not shutting the church down again. We acquiesced because we were afraid for each other. But I'm not sure all of this is really the issue. I think control was the issue. And God can carry us through. Thanks for joining us here today. We hope that you enjoyed the message and it made an impact in your life. Hey, you want to make sure and visit with us on the web at mycmbc.us. Also, be sure and stop by our Facebook page and follow the ministry of Crow Mountain Baptist Church. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Crow Mountain Baptist. Tune in next week for another amazing message. Have a great week. Thank you.